It is Sandra Faber from UCSC, who is going to give the first talk, please. Thanks, Mariana. I'm going to talk about black hole scaling relations that originate from a black hole quenching model. And lot, I've talked about the basic model idea previously in this workshop, but there's been a change to the picture of Green Valley galaxies that actually improves scaling relation predictions, and that's what I want to tell you about today. Um, first of all, let me pay homage to my uh, co-authors and the collaborators, many of whom are in the audience. So lots of people at Santa Cruz and the Hebrew University and UNAM and many places have, have contributed to these thoughts. So I'm probably going to go over and not finish. Uh, so I'm going to start with my conclusions so you get the basic idea. Um, there are three basic ingredients in this model that black hole mass grows as a power of this quantity sigma 1. Sigma 1 is the projected surface density within 1 kpc of the center of the galaxy. While galaxies are on the star forming main sequence, then it accelerates relative to sigma 1 as galaxies enter the green valley. That's the main thing I want to tell you about. Galaxies enter the Green Valley when this condition is satisfied, when the total effective energy from the black hole is equal to four times the halo gas binding energy. So that's a condition for quenching, which is somewhat new. It, it it's, uh, disagrees with um, what many sem semi-analytic models have said in the past. And quenching is complete when the black hole energy is approximately 40 times E bind. Uh, and let me just say at the outset that the results that we're getting from this simple model, if I were to compare to any of the hydro models, there's really remarkable agreement between what this simple model says and EAGLE, the EAGLE models. Is there anybody here from EAGLE? Raise your hand. There have been? Yeah, OK. Well, Mark, I've been talking to you already. And maybe we, maybe we could chat afterwards, because uh, I, I'd like to carry on some further work with EAGLE. What are the implications of this basic picture? It says that black hole scaling laws are different in different stages of galaxy evolution. This is star forming main sequence, green valley, and quenched. And taking note of this fact actually reconciles the fact that historically different uh, works that have tried to uh, establish scaling law slopes have disagreed with each other. And now we can understand pretty much why that's happened, because um, the resulting slopes have depended actually on the samples used, and people didn't realize that. Black holes gain most of their mass in the Green Valley, where they grow by a factor of 30. And this helps to explain the large black hole difference between the Milky Way and M31, as I'll show you. You can get a single tighter black hole scaling law by adding specific star formation rate to sigma 1. I'll show you how to do that. <clears throat> you may have heard of something called the black hole fundamental plane, which says that black hole mass is a um, scaling law of both effective radius and M star. <clears throat> and it's my opinion that that's not really fundamental. What we're doing is we're using M star and R effective together as surrogates for either sigma 1 or the velocity dispersion. And it's these two laws that are really fundamental. So the black hole fundamental plane is actually not fundamental. And finally, um, it follows from all of this that the black hole mass is really closely related to the halo mass, MVR, but differently so for galaxies in different phases of their evolution. And again, that, that helps to explain some contradictory results that have appeared about um, halo scaling in the literature. So those are my conclusions. Let me explain what this model is supposed to do that it, other models don't do. It's motivated by the fact that there's a quenching boundary in some coordinate systems here that divide quenched galaxies from star-forming galaxies. And here's the key point. This boundary is tilted. It's not just a function of mass. It's a function of both mass and, in this case, sigma 1, or also, equivalently, mass and the radius of galaxies. And this tilt, matching this tilt, requires introducing a second parameter, 
which you can think of as being essentially effective radius. And I'll explain how that works. So now, at the outset, just getting you oriented, how well does this work if, um, if you, in addition, assume, as I told you before, that galaxies enter the Green Valley, that is to say they cross this quenching boundary, when the effective energy of the black hole is four times the gas binding energy, this is the gas binding energy, then you get the blue lines in this diagram. And the purpose of this diagram is to compare the blue and the red lines. The red lines are the empirically observed boundaries. And this very, very simple theory of quenching based on uh, binding energy of halo gas in the halo gives you the blue lines. So these figures now show you how well this very, very simple schematic rule actually succeeds in matching both the tilt, pretty much, and the motion of the boundary as a function of redshift. These, this was redshift here. Okay. So that's kind of the bottom line success. Now, let me zip through quickly for the purpose of people who have not heard this before, the basic gist of the theory. It's convenient to start in a diagram of effective radius versus M star, and these are Candle's galaxies. The basic notion is that star-forming galaxies evolve on parallel tracks in this space until they encounter this quenching boundary. Okay. So while galaxies are star-forming, their stellar mass and their effective radius are determined by dark halo properties. M star comes from M vir, and the effective radius comes from R vir, and a third parameter, delta question mark, because we really don't know what that is. It might be differences in concentration among halos at the same mass, or it might be time of halo formation, or maybe it doesn't have anything to do with, with halos at all. The, the theory doesn't actually need to explain it, but it does say that, that galaxies with different values of this second parameter, delta sigma one, are each on their own separate track, and you stay there uh, permanently throughout your lifetime. <clears throat> so the track offset is assumed constant for life. And this basic picture of how galaxies evolve in effective radius versus mass have, has been mentioned before Van Dockum and even before him, Arjen van der Waal, back in 09, introduced evolutionary models that look like this. The quenching boundary itself corresponds to when your black hole has more energy than four times the binding energy. The energy of the black hole is going up faster in the theory than this quantity, E bind. The black hole overtakes the halo and um, provides enough energy input or momentum, it's not clear what it is, the theory is not specific, to profoundly affect the halo gas and prevent it from cooling onto the galaxy. And this criterion here is where galaxies enter the Green Valley. So when I talk about the quenching boundary, I mean the boundary of the Green Valley. So I've told you about one space, effective radius and M star. There's another space that's related, and that's sigma one versus M star. And the purpose of this slide is simply to establish that for candles and also for Sloan, this quantity, central density, for star-forming galaxies is given by this. And I want you to see that it's approximately M over R effective, because we're going to come back to that. And M over R effective is approximately velocity dispersion. So hidden right here in this diagram are the keys for why velocity dispersion is a good predictor of black hole mass. The point is, though, that now we started out with this space. And by mapping sigma onto it, we've now got three variables that are connected. And that means that if we have evolutionary tracks in R effective versus M star, we also have analogous evolutionary tracks in sigma one versus M star. This was a diagram that was first produced by Jerome Fang. Here are quenched galaxies in red, and here are star forming galaxies. And so the difference, the division between quenched and star forming that we saw in effective radius versus mass is reproduced here in this diagram because this is a projection, a different projection, but of the same space. 
Okay, and so if there's a quenching boundary in R versus M, there's also a quenching boundary in this space. This is how galaxies are evolving over the quenching boundary. And now I'm going to make the last key assumption. I'm going to assume that the black hole mass is a power of this quantity here, central density sigma 1. And without going into details, that's motivated by the good old sigma to the fourth law and the fact that sigma 1 in mass is very closely related to central velocity dispersion. So there's some justification for that. Put this all together, and lines of constant sigma 1 become lines of constant black hole mass. Here are such lines. And that means that you can read black hole mass off directly off of this diagram for galaxies that are star forming. And we're not the pe first people to say that. This notion is already in the literature. Quantitatively, this, the fact that um, uh, black hole mass depends on sigma at fixed m star introduces a big difference in black hole mass between the top of this distribution and the bottom. And I'm showing you what it is. It's a factor of 17. So black holes are quenching in this picture. Galaxies are evolving along tracks that look like this. These black holes have small, these galaxies have smaller black holes than those. And as a result, they have to evolve farther before their black hole overcomes the halo. And that is what accounts for the tilt and the quenching boundary. The ten quenching boundary tilt reflects the fact that bigger galaxies at constant stellar mass start out with smaller black holes. OK, now the last mapping is um, to note that we now have M black hole coming from sigma 1. We had a space sigma 1 versus M star. We've mapped this onto this, and so now we have another space. So altogether, we have four variables that are all connected, and all of these mass scaling laws with these variables simply project that space against different pairs of coordinates. And so what I'm wanting you to show, to see here, is that crudely speaking, the picture of M black hole versus stellar mass looks like sigma 1 versus stellar mass. Here, from Terrazas et al., these are star-forming galaxies in blue, and that's the quenched ridge line, looking like the sigma 1 diagram. And so, just driving the point home, if there are evolutionary tracks here, there are also evolutionary tracks there. That's how galaxies evolve in black hole mass versus stellar mass. OK, now, in more detail, the law linking sigma 1 and M black hole depends on the evolutionary state of the galaxy. This pattern here, this cartoon, is assumed to be constant at all redshifts in, with respect to the zero points of these law. So we start with the law for star forming galaxies. And this has a slope of 1.76. And then something magical happens. And depending on your radius, you depart from the star forming track. You cross over the quenching boundary. These inflection points are the boundary. And you go into the Green Valley. And sooner or later, you quench completely. And you take up residence permanently along the quenched locus. OK, so the track of an individual galaxy looks like that. And the location of the inflection point is given by this criterion, E black hole is four times the gas bounding energy. OK, so now <clears throat> let me put some data on here. This is where M31 and the Milky Way sit. And it's widely thought that the Milky Way is just entering the Green Valley. And M31 is at sort of the top of the Green Valley. And so if, if you like that idea, this helps you understand why a very small change in galaxy mass and also central sigma here, sigma 1, results in a big difference between uh, black hole masses of M31 and the Milky Way, which otherwise have had no explanation. This helps us understand that. OK, well, back to this diagram. Where are we getting the parameters of this diagram? Let's start with the quenching law. And that is simply normalized to local black hole masses of quenched galaxies, both slope and normalization. So that's the Cormandy ho slope for quenched galaxies. And now, here's where we do something sort of sneaky and tricky. 
how did we get the, the law for this, gal this set of galaxies? First of all, we need some normalization, and we normalize to local star-forming black hole masses. Take the average, normalize. But here's the tricky point. We're assuming that the slope here is parallel to this slope. And the reason why we're able to do that is this, uh, an assumption about what galaxies are doing in the Green Valley. If you assume that all these Green Valley vectors are the same length and parallel, then this slope just translates into that one. So why do we say that? Why is that a good thing? Well, let's go back to this diagram here, which I encouraged you to, I, before to think that this was the same as this, but in more detail you can see it's not because these star-forming galaxies extend all the way up to the ridge line when we use sigma-1, this is sigma-1 here, whereas they are well displaced from the, the quenched ridge line when we use black hole mass. And that difference was captured, so they're not actually the same, and that difference was captured recently in a, in a paper by Terrazas and company in which they plotted deltas Delta star formation versus delta black hole mass, delta star formation versus delta sigma one. And this is their diagram, and it's rather linear and uniform. This is the well-known elbow diagram using sigma one from Barrow et al. and Fang et al. And what, as we pointed out in these papers, there's an, a rapid change of direction here with an elbow. And Tarasas noted, hey, there's no elbow in this diagram and absolutely true. So this indicates to me, these are star forming galaxies on the main sequence. This is how you evolve through the Green Valley and become quenched, same thing here. Says that the path in black hole versus sigma one is different. The two paths are different. So I'm now going to show you how we get the slope of the Green Valley. This is the edge of the star forming main sequence here. This is my guess at where quenched galaxies take residence. And this is a big factor of black hole m growth. That's a factor of 30. And compare that now to um, similar uh, qualitative mean locations in sigma 1. And there's only 0.2 dex change in sigma 1. Take these two numbers and put them into the cartoon diagram. This is 1.5 dex, this is 0.2 dex. Assume that that translation is the same for all galaxies, regardless of what their black hole turnaround mass is, and also the same at all redshifts. So lots of assumptions here. It's a, it's a very schematic qualitative model, but that's how you justify taking this slope and, and deriving the slope of the blue line from the red line. Okay, here is <coughs> some data from Aldo. He has <coughs> traced out black hole growth tracks using abundance matching, and it's quite interesting that his tracks show kinks in the right locations. These are the scaling laws I just showed you. Aldo would say that we evolve along here and then suddenly we change direction a little bit in, as we move into the Green Valley. Pretty good agreement. And uh, the last thing I wanna say that's really important is that Terrazas data now says that lines parallel to the main scaling laws in the Green Valley are contours of constant specific star formation rate. So as I showed you from the delta delta diagram before, we get to the Green Valley and our specific star formation rate along here has been constant, but then it falls and it falls by about um, a factor of uh, 10 or so from here to here. So that would say that each location along each one of these vectors is labeled by the specific star formation rate, high here and low there. That suggests that you ought to be able to put the specific star formation rate together with sigma one to get an improved scaling law. And here is Aldo's attempt to do that. These are the Terrazas data just raw with M star versus sigma one. And now we add the scaling law versus specific star formation rate. The relation tightens. The predicted slope from the cartoon is 0.5 and what we get is actually 0.59. So it's not working too badly. So I'm, I need to summarize here and I'll stop 
by saying that I haven't had time to show you the scaling laws that Renzo, uh, sorry, that um, Remco Vandenbosch has derived. <clears throat> but um, maybe I'll just abuse my tenure just slightly. <laughs> no, I just want to show you a cartoon. Here's the, here's the cartoon, okay? You can see that if you're fitting all galaxies, as Remco does, quenched and star forming as well, you would tend to put a steep slope through that distribution, which would be steeper than the individual scaling laws. And um, the slope predicted by the cartoon is, this horribly simple cartoon is 2.6, and Remco's slope is actually 2.7 in contrast to the slopes that we're getting of 1.76 for the individual scaling laws, okay? So I could go on, but you've got the gist of the idea. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Questions? Oh, first here and then there. Uh, there, there needs to be one, yes, and, and the model says nothing about the physics of that. It's one of the big defects and gaps in the model. And also, I'm wondering, uh, so the slopes of the quench and the star forming sequences are the same, but that disagrees with some observations, like uh, the slope of the quench and the star forming sequences are the same, but that disagrees with some observations, like uh, Amy Ray's remarkable theory, they find different slopes. No, it, it doesn't disagree, because I'm plotting versus sigma 1, and they plot versus mass. Yes, I do know, we do know that it's not the time rate of change of the energy. Um, it's, so it's not m dot black hole versus some cooling rate or something like that. And the paper actually uh, presents two versions of that kind of model and they fail badly. What I haven't had a chance to explain here is that all of these things are evolving smoothly as a function of redshift. And so you have to reproduce these redshift trends. And that's, that's where the m dot models fall badly short. Now, as far as other explanations besides this, there might be, very well be, okay? Uh, there are some attractive things that really, l l it, it's sort of a, a nicely complete little package of galaxy evolution. It says that halos form, they control star forming galaxies. During the star forming phase, the properties relate directly to the halo. Meanwhile, the black holes, which are also growing according to related laws, overtake the halo and kill the halo. So it's, it's sort of a seductive package in which there's a parasite, you're growing a parasite within you and the parasite ultimately kills. So I like that because it's all, um, we're, we're not appealing to exotic physics and unknowns. Uh, it, it's very, you know, it's almost like the, the star forming main sequence, as simple as that. It could be wrong and, and I think we should think about maybe other other versions of E black hole that might work. Okay, let's thank Sandra Faber again, please.